Okay, so hi, uh, I'm Philip. I'm from Heconic Startup School. Um, what we're going to be talking about, or what I want to talk to you guys about today, or in these next 30 minutes, is about stories. And I want to tell you that stories are important, and I want to give you a couple of pieces of advice on how you can tell a better story. But before we go into that, just like Chris says, uh, it's probably useful if I tell you a couple of words about myself. So I, I studied philosophy and sociology of culture, which I guess is weird. I've been a hacker most of my life. I used to play classical guitar professionally. Uh, but today, the thing that pays my rent is what you can see on the slides. So I'm part of Reconic Startup School. Uh, we've got a bunch of programs. We take startups from the idea phase up to the point where they get an investment. And most of my time, what I'm going to be spending my time on is critiquing startups' pitches, the way they communicate with their customers, uh, the way they write their copy, the way they communicate with microcopy inside their own products to make sure that they're understood. Um, and just a couple of words on my experience. I used to be a debater as well. I used to win a couple of worlds in European championships. But mostly through my studies, I've studied language. And I've studied the way people communicate and what that actually does to us. And there's one thing that happens to me all the time. And this is that people, whenever they talk to me or whenever they talk to me about marketing or PR or any type of that kind of stuff, uh, they tend to think that what marketers and uh, political consultants and PR managers do is lie to people. And I want to dispel that myth, myth from the get-go, and I want to talk to you about wine. And the story that I want to tell you is a story of a very interesting experiment. So it's been repeated a couple of times, and it's always gotten the same results. The first time this experiment was run, it was run with wine, but if you do it with other things, the results are pretty much the same. So the idea is very simple. You take a couple of people, you bring them to a restaurant, you sit them at the table, and you call up a sommelier, so a guy who's dressed up, who knows everything about wine, the guy brings a bottle of wine, explains to the people, so this is this and this wine, it works well with this type of food, it's been raised here, it's a very good year, so on and so forth, and you give people this wine to drink, and they drink their wine, and then at the end of their dinner, you ask them to rate their wine. So you ask them, how good was this wine? And they rate it. And then uh, you bring them to a different situation, again, a restaurant, a dinner, but this time you don't give them a sommelier, you don't give them a story about the wine, you just pour them wine, it's like the regular bar wine, and people drink the wine, and again, you ask them, please rate the wine. And obviously, the people say that the first wine tastes about twice or two and a half times as better as the second wine. The point being that people were drinking from the same exact bottle both of the times. And what I want you to understand here is that the way we communicate doesn't only manipulate people, as a lot of people would like to think, but it actually creates a different reality for them. So for people who were drinking this wine, it didn't matter that the wine had the same chemical structure. Their own experience, the way this wine tasted for them, was significantly better. It wasn't an idea. They weren't tricked into paying more for this wine. Their own experience, the way they remember this glass of wine, is as a much, much, much better glass of wine. And I think that this is something that we're constantly forgetting about. And I think that it produces a range of bad effects from the point where you're not utilizing the power of your value proposition to its fullest extent to the point where you're communicating in such an inefficient way that you're actually going to reduce the value proposition that you bring to your customers. And it's not go only going to be a question of sales. It is actually going to be a question of experience. If you're not going to communicate what you're users and with your potential customers in a proper way, they're going to love your product less. And this is something that you should never allow to happen. So I want to talk to you about a couple of things. But the first thing that we have to realize is that we live in a world where we have absolutely everything we need. Right? All of you have enough food, you've got shoes, you've got clothes, you've got a place to sleep, and you're probably not very likely to lose those types of things. So our society has changed from a society where we used to buy what we needed, so when we had to get money to buy food and to buy bread and milk and stuff like that, into a society where we buy what we want. And I think that that is a very, very, very important consideration that we need to make. Now, it goes even further, right? 
The idea why this is so important is that what we want is determined by what we believe, right? So insofar as we're buying things that we actually need, right, these are going to be usually determined by our biological needs. So if you're going to be hungry, you're going to need food, you're going to buy food. But insofar as you have everything you might absolutely need, you're going to buy what you want. And the things that you want are going to be determined by the things you believe. So for instance, if you believe that being healthy is a very important thing. You're going to want to buy vitamins. You're going to want to do sports. You're not going to need those vitamins. You're not going to need those pills, but you still are going to want to buy them and you will buy them, right? And I think a very, very interesting phenomena is what is happening right now with women who are pregnant. So <laughs> we've been having babies for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and these babies were pretty much okay, right? So yes, every now and then one baby or a couple of babies come out slightly damaged or slightly broken, right? But at the end of the day, babies were perfectly fine. Now, today, in today's society, when we have things we want, everyone wants the best baby, everyone wants the best kid, they have to win at everything, they have to be amazing, they have to have an amazing life. And what pregnant women are going to be doing, they're going to be drinking calcium and vitamins, and they're going to be doing a bunch of different things because they want to have a healthier baby, even though, quite necessarily, they don't really have to. And I think that is a very, very, very important aspect of the society that we live in right now. And I think that insofar as this concerns your startup, right, I think it's important for us to recognize that VCs of all the people in the world are probably the ones who actually have everything they need, right? They've got tons and tons of money, so that isn't going to be a problem for them, right? But at the second time, I think it's very important for us to realize that VCs don't necessarily invest in your startup, so in your business, in, your, in the idea of your profitability, in the promise that you're going to be making future profits, they invest in your story. The reason why I believe that is that if VCs only wanted to make money, and if they only wanted to invest in things that would be profitable, we wouldn't call them venture capitalists, we would call them stockbrokers, right? Those are the people who are only concerned with the future projections of what the company is going to be. What venture capitalists are more and more concerned, and what their main reasons are for investing is the stories that you're going to tell, right? We're constantly talking about how companies are transforming the world, right? The myth of Steve Jobs is the guy who changed the face of the planet with the first really useful touchscreen, right? Isn't a story where we say, only the fact that Steve Jobs made X and X billions of dollars, but it's a story that we frame and that we think about in terms of what types of changes his products or Apple's products have brought into the world. And I think it's important for you to realize that if you're ever going to want to receive an investment, you are going to have to tell a story, right? The same way you're going to have to tell stories to your users. So this is why I think these things that we're going to be talking about in the following 20 minutes are important. Now, a couple of things about stories. Number one, a great story is always true. So if you do experiments with people and you put them in front of people who are instructed to lie, there's two types of experiments that people do. In one experiment, they tell people, so you have a bunch of different rules that you learn throughout life, learn throughout life about what people do when they're lying. If you tell people that they should figure out who's lying based on those rules, they fail, they suck. So everything you think about what the telltale signs of people lying are, you're probably wrong. But at the same time, if you tell people to disregard those rules and to simply decide based on their gut feeling, they're going to be right most of the time. And there's a bunch of different reasons for why that happens, and there's a bunch of interesting research that shows that, for instance, the emotions on your face are never particularly hidden. Right? There's this thing that is currently becoming popular called the micro-expressions. So effectively, even when you're trying to mask your fear or mask your pain, your face is going to twitch for a second, which your brain is going to recognize and we're going to see that something is off. And what I truly believe is that whenever you want to tell a great story, that story has to be true to yourself. You have to tell it from a point where you believe in it. You have to not only believe in the facts of the story, but you have to believe in the emotional value of the story as well. And we heard a lot about that yesterday when we had some speakers talk about how you should be truthful, how honesty is underrated. And I perfectly agree with that. One of the biggest things, or one of the most important things that I did at university was the way I communicated with my professors. So you've heard Chris, I 
apparently never responded to an email. I'm very bad at organizing my life. And I would constantly miss deadlines to apply for exams. And we have an electronic system, and three days before the exam, you have to say, I'm coming. And I would constantly be forgetting that. And my schoolmates, my classmates, would be doing that as well. Now, whenever I would do that, I would send an email to the professor, oh, please, can I still come? And they would usually say yes to me, but no to my classmates. And I talked to them about the way they communicate with their professors. And the difference was that they were usually writing fake examples or fake reasons why they weren't able to apply. Whereas I was always honest, right? If I forgot to apply, I sent an email, look, I was planning on doing this the last day, then my friend had a birthday and we went to party and I got drunk and I overslept the deadline, can I still come? And people understood that and they were like, yes, no problem, I understand these types of things happen, right? So whenever you want to tell a great story, that story has to be true to yourself. So don't try to lie, don't ever try to fabricate something that isn't necessarily true, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to venture capitalists, your future customers, or your existing users. Secondly, a great story always makes a promise. The reason we like stories, the reason we like fairy tales, are, is because we tend to extrapolate from them uh, patterns that we're going to be using in life. So if you watch a Disney movie, the promise that that story gives to you is that as long as you're going to follow your dreams, as long as you're going to be true to yourself, you're going to find love and everything is going to be great, right? Another promise that these types of stories give us is that people who are actually mean are going to suffer in life and we don't have to worry about that, right? religious stories that we tell ourselves, right? And it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim or any other type of religion, there's going to be a promise in that story, either a promise of heaven or a promise of hell or a promise of the end of the constant cycle of rebirth. And every story has a promise. And I think that whenever you're going to be communicating with your users or with your VCs, you must never forget about that promise. I see startups constantly asking VCs for money, whereas they never explain to them what exactly they're going to do with that type of cash. They never make a promise to the venture capitalists of what exactly they're going to change. In much the same way, when people try to communicate with their users, when they're testing out products, when we're doing this, oh, let's run an A-B test, so on and so forth, let's keep things lean, they still never explain to their users what the promise behind the use of that product is. People usually remain on the level of this is what it does, but it, they never give us a promise of what I'm going to feel like, what I'm going to achieve after I'm going to be using your product. So a great story is true, and a great story makes a promise. A great story is also trusted, and I think that's very, very, very important. Right? We tend to go through life thinking that the credibility that we possess is given to us on a silver platter, right? So we tend to believe that because we know what experience we have, other people are going to be aware of that as well, which is simply not true. And I think it comes down to this in a variety of different settings, especially and as well as when you pitch to VCs. So teams that pitch tend to present their teams in a very glib way. So it's like, ah, this is us, there's three pictures, this is what we do, let's move on. Right? But that is not enough, because VCs know that things aren't going to go according to plan. VCs know that there's a bunch of people who have random ideas that aren't necessarily feasible. VCs know that 90% of startups fail, and they need to trust you, they need to believe that you are going to be able to succeed. The same thing goes for users. So for instance, we had a bit of a fight, let's say, at Heconic uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were discussing what tool we're going to be using, and there was, there was a couple of people who were arguing for Evernote, and then there was a couple of people who were arguing for Hackpad. And the argument at the end of the day that won, and why we're now using Evernote, is that Hackpad is a startup, and we cannot trust them that they will be live in six months or a year, so there's no way we can put our core business uh, processes on a service that we cannot trust will still be in existence. So it isn't only about VCs, it's also about your users, right? So just consider all of the different solutions that you have on the internet, even the way people make decisions whether or not they're going to build their website with WordPress or Drupal or something else. It often comes down to trust, right? So this is very, very, very important. You should never take for granted that you have credibility to the people that you're talking to. You should always make sure that you do build that credibility. Now lastly, 
a great story appeals to the senses. And I think this is very, very, very important. Oftentimes, people are going to be communicating in a very, very Spartan way. So they're going to be using little, world, little words that are only going to be describing actions, whereas they are never going to tell people how they're going to feel. They are never going to paint a picture in other words. And if you consider very, very great writers and big novels and books and poetry that we all enjoy, these are all works of art that speak to the senses, right? We always have this hero and we know what they feel and they tell us that they're currently feeling a big pressure inside their chest and consider this the moment as I'm going to start explaining this right you're going to start to question these things and notice them on yourself so think about how sometimes when we sit on a chair it gets a little wet when we sit because the sweat starts dripping there and it gets slightly uncomfortable and you start getting the need to shift a little and you might want to change and you get bored and sometimes you're tired and your legs hurt and the way your brain functions is that as soon as I start explaining these things you're going to start simulating in your brain and I think it's very important to understand that and if you want a user or a VC to come on board with you to either use your product or to either give you money, they're going to have to be able to simulate the experience of what's going to happen in the future. And if they're unable to do that, they're never going to buy your product, use your product, or give you money. And the only way people can efficiently simulate the experience that they're going to have in the future is by you giving them the context, the way they're going to feel using those things, and so on and so forth. So it is very, very, very important for a story to appeal to the senses. Now, I want to tell you a story. It's one of my favorite stories. And it's a story about a blind boy. And this blind boy is sitting on the pavement, and he's got a sign in front of him, and it says, I'm blind, please help. And next to the sign is a hat, and people start throwing money in that hat, and as people pass by, sometimes they will throw a coin. Right? Until one, uh, one day, a guy walks by, and he throws some money into the hat, and he picks up the sign, he turns it around and writes something else, and he puts the sign back down, and he goes away. And the boy is sitting there, and people start walking by, and he can hear that there's more and more coins falling into the hat. And it's not just only coins, it is now becoming paper money as well. So he reaches his hand forward, and he feels that the hat is almost full, and he takes some money out, so there's still going to be space, and the hat keeps on piling up, right? So he's getting more and more money. And towards the evening, he hears the same footsteps he heard in the morning, so he recognizes the same guy who comes back and he stops him and he says, Mister, what did you do with my sign? What did you write on the other side? And he says, I said the same thing you said, I just said it differently. And when the little boy had written, I am blind, please help, the guy turned around the sign and on the other side it said, today is a beautiful day and I cannot see it. And the only difference that that produces, right, the only difference between variation one and variation two was the way in which the blind boy communicated his condition with that sign. And in the second option, he gave us the experience that we get, and he showed us how it feels to be blind. Because when he told us simply, I am blind, please help, none of the passers-by were able to simulate the horror of being blind. None of the passers-by were able to understand what it means to be blind even for a little bit and as soon as the sign said today is a beautiful day look around you and now imagine not being able to experience that the reaction in the people completely changed and I think that this is the change that a different type of communication can bring to your startup to your life and to your pitches in front of VCs so here's the secret and these are a couple of pieces of advice that I think are going to be very useful for you as long as you're going to follow them. Number one, the clicker isn't working. Ha! Huh. Number one, your audience's worldview got here before you did. I think oftentimes startups tend to assume that everyone who's going to be communicating with them, everyone who's going to be experiencing their own service, has been thinking about it 24-7 for the past couple of months. This is not true. 
People have their own lives, they have their own wor worldviews, they have their own beliefs, they have their own experiences, they fell in love, they were disappointed, they have lost their brother, sister, parents, so on and so forth. So when you do open your business model canvas and when you do open the book and go start doing your empathy maps, these things are important. And these things are important so that you can understand how your potential customers view the world so that you can then communicate with them in a way that resonates with them. Right? So consider this, you see a girl or a guy, it doesn't really matter, that you like very much and you have two options. You can either walk up to that person and say, fall in love with me and nothing's going to happen. Right? The other way you can do this is to take them out on a date, to maybe go to a movie, to spend some time with them, to build the experience, to fall into that world view of what exactly is happening to them and only then will they fall in love. And the second thing that is very important here is that you need to realize that the way your parents fell in love, the way you are falling in love right now, and the way people are going to be falling in love in 10 and 15 years are completely different things. And they all depend on the way we live our lives, they all depend on the worldviews that we have, and things that are romantic right now, things like roses, things like taking care of someone, so on and so forth, might not have been romantic before. And things that have been romantic before or are romantic in a variety of different societies are not going to be romantic to you, right? So even people in Korea, for instance, have a completely different way of understanding what romance is than people in Europe. And it comes down to the smallest thing, the way you eat your food, the way you order your drinks, so on and so forth. So it becomes very, very, very important to understand your customer, but not only to understand them, but to speak in a language that is close to them. And if you optimize this, there's a very, very cool trick. So advertising online is very cheap right now. So you can spend 50 euros on Google ads or on Facebook ads, and you're going to get a lot of clicks or a lot of views on those ads. What I would suggest to you is to try and write different types of copy, not only with different types of value propositions, but communicating that value proposition in a different way, then figuring out which of the ads people click the most. And then you can realize what type of language they use when they think about their own problem and you can then trans transform the language on your landing page on other forms of communication to fit that. The same way as you're doing customer interviews, you should be listening for the words that people use to describe their own problems because this is the way they experience them and this is the way you're going to be communicating with them if you want to be successful. Advice number two. People only notice the new, right? There's a bunch of stuff happening right now. We are flooded with information. We are flooded with new services, especially on the internet. So this idea, which is fairly old, that people only notice the new is truer today than it was ever before. And it is important for you to realize that. But that doesn't mean that you should make your page in fluorescent colors so that everyone gets an epileptic attack as they see it, right? But it gives you the idea that you need to position yourself towards other things on the market. You need to explain to people why this is a new thing. You need to show them what the difference is from the other things that they were trying out. Unless you're able to communicate that difference, the, your users, your VCs, your potential customers don't have a reason to choose you over anyone else. So it is very, very, very important to understand this and it is at the same time very important to know your market so that you can successfully communicate these ideas. Lesson number three, tell stories you believe. I think this is very, very, very important. And this might be bad news for some of you, but if you're not having fun at the startup that you're doing right now, if you're not enjoying your work, you're never going to be truly successful at it. Because the way you're going to talk to your friends about it, the way you're going to talk to your coworkers about this, the way you're going to talk to your mom about this, the way you're going to communicate with your potential customers about this is going to show that. And when you believe in something, you completely change the way in which you communicate about that. And it is often little tiny things, but it comes at a cost, right? Whenever you are going to be telling stories you believe, whenever you are going to be telling about things that are truly important to you, you are going to be exposing yourself to other people. But there's nothing wrong with that. I want you to remember that in general, 
and in the vast majority of cases, people, other people, feel the same way. Everyone is awkward when we have to socialize at meetups. Everyone feels slightly strange when they have to go for that first kiss. Everyone is extremely anxious when it comes to the first time when you're about to have sex and you have to take your clothes off, unless you're desperately drunk or high on drugs, right? But these are the experiences that each and every one of us feel, and it is something that people appreciate, and it is something that you should appreciate for yourselves as well. And I think there's one thing that is very important for you to remember here. Whenever people are going to give you feedback, and that feedback is not going to be the best feedback out there, maybe they're going to be saying mean things. It becomes very hard to continue doing that as a process. It becomes very hard to start doing that on a long-term basis because it damages your ego and it doesn't feel nice. Well, at that point, I want you to remember that the judgments these people are making are not judgments about yourself, but are judgments about what you told them. The only information they have is the stuff that came out of your mouth. And whenever somebody says that your idea is stupid or that your idea m doesn't make sense, that doesn't mean that your idea is necessarily stupid, but it definitely means that the, the way you're communicating about this idea is losing its target customers, is losing its audience. And you don't have to change yourself. You don't have to feel sorry for yourself. You just have to change the way in which you communicate. Now, lastly, when do you know when you've succeeded? It's when your story has come true. I think you should set straight goals. I think you should make sure that you do make your stories come true. I think it's important that you make your stories. Um, please find me on Twitter, find Hekonic on Twitter, and there's one thing that I do have a request for you. There's a URL in the bottom. We're now figuring out ways with which to go online. If you find the time to look at the web page and send me an awful rant about everything that's wrong with that, I'm going to buy you a beer next time I see you. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, three more minutes for some questions. So sure. um, if you have questions, please ask them now. Hi, thank you very much for this great presentation on storytelling. Uh, my question is if you have a team uh, in which the members are not good at storytelling. Which way, way, which way shall we go for? To find, to find a co-founder who is a good storyteller or try to, to learn the storytelling, which, Become uh, a good which storyteller. seems to be quite tough and not something that you can learn in relatively short term. I can imagine that it uh, took you quite long to become yeah. a good presenter. So, <laughs> Yeah, I've been debating professionally for nine years. I think you should all become good storytellers. I think that goes far beyond than you just making your startup work, work right? Th through my studies of language, I, I desperately believe that language is broken, and there is absolutely no way for us to communicate fully what we feel, and it, we are all constantly struggling with to be understood, to make sure that the people who are listening to us understand what we're trying to say. And I think that this is a skill that you should be honing all the time. There is a very, very simple way in which you can, f in which you can do this, and uh, it's gather a couple of friends, go for a beer every Friday or every Thursday, set an hour aside, and there's one simple thing that you have to do. A couple of days before, Pick a theme, a couple of words like disappointment or love or understanding. And then when you give people time to prepare, and then when you meet, everyone should tell a story on that theme. And don't invite strangers because it's going to be awkward for you. Only invite friends. Keep doing that for a month or two. Keep critiquing each other. Find ways in which things are going to work. And I guarantee you, you're going to see results. The most important thing about storytelling, as far as I'm concerned, isn't theory. This, whatever you heard here, doesn't matter. You can forget all about this. As long as you're going to be telling stories for the next month, every single day, nothing that I said matters, because you're going to get much more value from actually trying to communicate. Questions? The biggest kindergarten in Sofia. Yeah? Hey, Philip, that was uh, a great great presentation. I want to thank you. It's the best so far. Thanks. Sorry, Chris. Your sucks. <laughs> 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 and he, my question is related to the previous one. Uh, you did a great presentation, great show on stage. 
and uh, people think it comes, it's natural. Uh, so my question is, how long did you practice? How many times did you pitch before you could do it so well? Uh, this? This. This is my first time. Oh my but, God. But, but there is a very important thing here. Help so me I've been Say that practicing matters. <laughs> yeah, no, no, practice matters, but I've been doing competitive debating for nine years now, first in high school and then at university for four and a half years. The way debating at university level works is you get a theme, you get a statement that you have to say is either true or untrue. You you toss a coin and you get 15 minutes to prepare and when you're doing that for five years almost every single weekend you debate five or six different motions stuff happens to your brain right and it wasn't like I so I do lectures like this all the time this wasn't completely new I just took Legos from different parts that I've been talking about and put them together but I think practice does matter you can learn how to tell a story rather than be born with the skill. It's not a yeah. something in your genetics. Rather. Nobody is born with the skill. It's language. It's purely social. Right? So this is something that nobody is born with. The first time I had a speech at a debating tournament, I had it written down. I had every word on a paper. I had three pages for five minutes of talking. I spoke for two and a half minutes and only got through the first page before I decided that this was too hard and I'm sitting down even though that means we're losing. So this is the position that I started from and I think that we should all recognize that and you just have to start telling stories. Cool. Okay, so there is a question in the yeah, back. Yeah. My question is, you've studied this in high school, you've studied it in university here in Bulgaria. S high schools and universities don't offer this sort of training. Um, you've been here and I think that you may have seen Bulgarians present other places. Do you see an obvious difference? Do you think that this is something that can be learned at a later stage outside yes. of university? Yes, this is something that you can learn at any point whatsoever. And it wasn't that I had a subject at high school at, at a university. I was at university and this was a club of people who were enthusiasts. All right, so I think that you should do a debate club, right? Uh, if anyone has a pen and is interested in it, it's debate.uvm.edu is the large is the world's largest resource on how you do this. There's over 500 lectures, some of them even by me, a lot of them by people much smarter and more experienced than me. So just go and do it. Seriously, this is all about talking. You can do it anywhere, anytime. So there's absolutely no excuse for you not to be practicing.